Well, hello everyone. It is great to be back. And I want to ask you a question. How should we go to church? I wonder if you've thought about that at all. And you might answer, well, isn't it pretty obvious? You just get in a car and you drive to the building, like right here. If you're a part of Faith Church 2124, Old Philadelphia Pike, you can just plug it in your GPS, get there, walk inside the building, and you sit down in one of these pews. Or in recent months, you might answer, well, you get out your laptop, you click on the link, and you join the Zoom broadcast. Or maybe you do what you're doing right now and click on the YouTube link. But is that all there is to it, to just show up? Today, we're going to church. Now, if you're in the building, uh, if you're on YouTube as you are right now, you could say, but aren't we already in church? Well, yeah, but as we continue our study of Ecclesiastes, the teacher takes us to church. What he's doing is basically asking that question, how should we go to church? And in so doing, He's not thinking about the transportation. He's not thinking about any kind of technology that helps us to connect online. He's not even thinking about showing up at a worship service so much. He's talking about our hearts, about our minds, how we think and how we feel about this thing that we call church. It goes by many different names, worship, mass, liturgy, temple, maybe even. And so far in Ecclesiastes, the teacher's theme has been about how fleeting life is and, and how we should enjoy the time that God has given us. And last week, David preached the beginning of a three-part mini-series on the very central section of the book of Ecclesiastes. Well, today we're looking at the center of the center. That means that the teacher intended us to see this particular section as incredibly important. So, He's been guiding us all along about the meaning of life. And today he is saying that we should think about worship as incredibly important. It is central to understanding the meaning of life. Therefore, how we think about worship is vital. So take a look at verse one in Ecclesiastes chapter five. The NIV translates the very first words of this section, guard your steps when you go into the house of God. Now, immediately I thought to myself, wait a minute, is he saying that church buildings are God's house? Now, I know some of you might wanna answer, well, yes, of course they are. And I don't mean to disappoint you, but the answer is actually no. The teacher here is not talking about church buildings. So what is he talking about, this house of God? Well, Dr. Dorsey's translation, I think really answers it for us. He says, that actually this verse could be translated, be careful when you come to God's temple. See, the teacher worshiped at the actual temple in the city of Jerusalem, where God's presence actually resided in a building. And so it was properly called the house of God. But before we hear about what the teacher is saying about worship in the house of God, we need to see that that you and I as Christians are in a very different situation than what the teacher was. We don't go to the temple as he did. God's presence doesn't actually live in our church buildings. I get it that buildings are often referred to as God's house, but that's not biblically correct. Why? Because the apostle Paul would later write in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, that our bodies are the temple of God and, and his Holy Spirit actually lives within us. We are God's house, not a building. So even though that cultural situation between us and the teacher is different, and even though he did go to a building that was properly called the house of God, the temple, and, and we don't go to that building, we can still learn from what he has to say about worship. And what he will do in the remaining uh, teaching here, in the rest of verses 1 all through verse 7, is talk about three aspects of worship. First of all, he's going to talk with us about sacrifice, then he'll talk about prayer, and finally a longer section on vows. So let's see what he has to say first about sacrifice in the rest of verse 1. He says this, Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. Now, Dorsey translates it this way, Obedience is better than the sacrifices offered by fools. Fools are experts in wrongdoing. 
What does the teacher mean by that word sacrifice? Well, in the Israelite religion, there was a ton of sacrifice. They literally killed animals, giving their body, giving their blood over to the Lord as a worship offering. Well, for us as Christians, again, the situation's different. Since Jesus gave his body and his blood as the permanent sacrifice, Christians don't practice ritual sacrifice anymore. So we could be tempted to think about that particular concept there in verse 1 as something that has nothing to do with our Christian worship. But let me try to explain how I think the teacher's words can still apply to us. When he mentions sacrifice, he's talking about the ritual practices or the ritual elements of worship. And we can compare his words to our practice of ritual. Now, you might think to yourself, what ritual are you talking about, Joel? We do not sacrifice animals. You just said that. Well, we have plenty of Christian rituals. What comes to mind when you hear me say that? Christian rituals. In fact, if you were in a worship service and I was preaching this live in front of you, I would have said, guess what? We already practice rituals today. Think about it. Some churches we know are more ritualistic and some are less so, but I think we observe rituals in just about every church. It, it could be just simply the order of worship. It could be sitting in pews like these, singing songs. Now, the delivery of a sermon. It's a ritual that we go through every week. And that's what rituals are, things that we do over and over and over. There were even a couple of them that Jesus himself instituted. You might have thought of that already. Baptism and communion. And then we also have others that are more formal like that. Could be child dedications, could be, um, we said baptisms, it could be marriages, it could be uh, funerals. All of these things have an element of ritual to them. The problem with rituals is that they can lose their meaning if we let them. Now, I often hear this said about churches that use the Lord's Prayer every single week or churches that say the Apostles' Creed every single week, maybe others that have communion every week. When we do something over and over like rituals, we can actually start to say words without even thinking about them. They just roll out of our mouths with no brain content barely going on at all. And when that happens, there's one commentator who looked at this passage. He said this, that worshipers are so foolish that they are not even aware that their sacrifices are evil, an offense to God. So as a result, some Christians have, have noticed that trend of what they call dead ritual or empty ritual, and they've tried to abandon all ritual whatsoever. But that's not what the teacher is saying here. Rituals actually can be very, very healthy. They can be formative. And I would go so far to say as that we need ritual when it is done with the right motivation. I actually think it would be incredibly difficult to have any kind of gathered expression of church or gathered worship without at least some kind of ritual. But here's the thing. The teacher is saying that there is something else that God deeply desires. The, NV, the, uh, the NIV translates it as listening. Uh, Dorsey translates it as obedience. And those two terms sound very different. How are listening and obedience the same? But I think you actually might know that we use those terms very similarly. For example, when a child disobeys, the parent says to the child, you didn't listen to me. It didn't mean that they think that the child didn't hear the rule. They mean the child broke the rule. God wants us to listen to him, to obey his word. In fact, what the teacher is saying is God would much rather us to listen to him, to obey him, than go through empty rituals. It's a regular refrain in scripture. To obey is better than sacrifice. In other words, just showing up for church worship services and going through the ritual isn't going to get you any brownie points with God. If the rest of your life is lived in a way that does not honor him. So, we have to think about how do we worship? How do we come to worship? The teacher is actually saying that our lives outside of the gathered worship are really what matter to God most. He wants us to lead lives of faithful obedience to his way. That's where worship begins. Now, he gives us 
a important caution about empty ritual and, and how we need to live lives of obedience. But then he moves on to the next section, and that is about prayer in worship. Look at verse 2. And here again, I think Dorsey's translation is so helpful. He says this, do not be like them. Do not be glib in what you say to God or hasty in what you promise. Remember, God is in heaven. You are on earth. So let your words be few. Now, one commentator explains this phrase, and he says, we see in this the vast distance between God and human beings, and we see the need for humans to be quiet before God. Now, remember, the teacher, the teacher here, he's talking about God in his unique perspective, and that's very different from the way that we Christians experience God. He was writing like hundreds of years before Jesus was born. So, it would be genuinely big news if the teacher found out about Jesus. He would be astounded by the idea of God in the flesh. Remember what I said? He would also be astounded by the idea that Christians, our bodies, are the temple of God. The teacher here is actually very much in line with Old Testament Israelite thinking about God. They, they see God in a, in a way that God's presence actually resided in the temple, and he was conceived or, or thought of as utterly different from humans. Well, we Christians would still view God the Father that way, as, as separate from us, almost in a, in a sense distant from us. But we also have this un expanded understanding of God that he was God the Son, he was Jesus, the Word became flesh, and he lived among us. And then we also have the idea of the God, the Spirit, living in us. So we should consider God as he truly is, in his holiness, in his perfection, in his love, in his justice, and have this present awareness of how amazingly different he is from us, yes, but also that we can be close to him. And therefore, as the teacher says, we need to be quiet before him. That quietness is one way that we talk about prayer. So often our prayers are just a speedy barrage of words. Like we turn the fire hose on and just gush to the Lord. And we're asking him for all kinds of stuff. Now that's not necessarily wrong. God wants to hear from us. But the teacher provides a needed corrective when it comes to prayer. Our worship should include silent consideration of God. Now, in this, the Quakers have us beat. They include long periods of silence in worship. In fact, on my running, I run past a Quaker meeting house in Burdenham, just down the road here. And I've often thought, I wonder what that place is like on a Sunday. I really want to visit it sometime. It's why here at Faith Church over the years, from time to time, we've held silent Sundays where our worship service was almost exclusively silent. And I think we need to include more silence in our lives, both individually and corporately when we gather for worship. Now, I'm going to ask you, let's put a pin in that idea, because we're going to come back to it as the teacher himself comes back to it. For now, let's move on to see what else he says about prayer in verse 3. The NIV says this, As a dream comes when there are many cares, so the speech of a fool when there are many words. Remember here, verses 2 and 3 are about prayer in worship. And so whatever he just said right there about dreams and fools and words has to do with prayer. Again, I found the commentator uh, very helpful. He says this, As one can expect dreams or some kind of uneasy sleep during the preoccupation that accompanies heavy work, so one can expect to find a fool behind a loquacious speaker. Thus, the point is clearly drawn. Only a fool prays a lot. I thought, wait a minute. Only a fool prays a lot? Can that be right? Can the teacher really be saying that? Aren't we supposed to pray a lot? Jesus taught in Luke 18 that we should pray and not give up. Is Jesus disagreeing with the teacher? I don't think so. And here's why. Because Jesus also taught in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. 
that is right in line with what the teacher is saying here. Now, we should be persistent in prayer. Jesus is exactly right in Luke 18. We should pray and not give up. Especially when it comes to gathered worship, though, we really need to be observant about our motivations, about our heart. We should want to avoid making a spectacle of ourselves in worship. That's foolish, the teacher says. And Jesus agrees. We shouldn't want to get up in a worship service constantly and pray these long, flowery prayers to make it sound like we're spiritual and close to God as a show. There is something else, too, that can be very foolish. And the teacher tells us in verses 4 and 5, vows. And that's the next section. Essentially, in verse 4, the teacher says, fulfill your vows. But then in verse 5, it's like he's thinking about this a second, and he says, you know what? You're actually better off not to make vows at all, because then you don't have to worry about fulfilling your vow. So better to not make a vow than to open your mouth, make a vow, and not keep it. Now, what are these vows that he's talking about? Here again, I go to the words of the commentator, and he says this, when taking a vow, worshipers committed themselves to undertake some kind of action. And often for them in the Old Testament, it was a sacrifice. If God would answer a specific request, they would make a vow. Or to maybe just get God's favor. I wonder if you've ever done that. Lord, if you just help me out this time, I swear to you, I will come to church more often. Vows take many forms, though. It could be that we say, Lord, if you, if you just help me out here, I will pledge you my time and service. We could give our time, we could give our talent, we could give our treasure. Many times we've taken vows, though, in, in a very serious way, in a, in a way that we mean it. Like, we could say we are committing to serve in a ministry. Um, it could be that we actually do take a vow be, to another person. That's what marriage is, right? A marriage vow. It could be that we take a vow to our family. That's what a parent does when they dedicate their child. They vow to raise that child before the Lord. As members of a church family, we will often take a vow of membership before a congregation saying that we pledge to fulfill certain aspects of that, of that membership commitment. And when we do that vow, that person or that whole group of people are counting on us. This happens a lot in church, actually. For example, at Faith Church, we have a congregational meeting coming up in November. We do it every year. And one of the big things we do is vote on a budget. Well, we should see that as a vow. Now, you may not have thought of that as a vow, but it really is. It's a promise. It's an agreement of a church family that says together in unity, Throughout the next calendar year, we are going to fund that budget. And what we mean by that is that we're actually going to give financial gifts on a regular basis to the church so that throughout that whole next year, we can keep our financial commitments. Now, there are many other vows in a church family. Um, maybe you've agreed to serve on a committee. And when you do that, you vow to go to certain meetings. Or when you agree to serve at, on a ministry, you're you're helping out. Because of all of these kinds of vows, the teacher cautions in verse 6, and I love how Dorsey translates it. He says, do not let your mouth get you into trouble. How many of you have allowed your mouth to get you into trouble? And probably all hands go up. I definitely have. But remember, the context here is worship. He's talking about your mouth getting you into trouble, and you think, well, how does that work? Because when we're gathering together for a worship service, we're not really making vows all that much. But I would suggest to you that when we gather for worship services every week, we make vows every single week. How? Well, think of the songs that we sing. When we sing worship songs, I think they're incredibly similar to taking a vow. When you sing a song to God, you're actually making a commitment to him. So what happens when you sing a song which has these amazing lyrics, but you don't actually mean them, or you don't actually follow through with what the lyrics have said? The rest of your week does not look like the, what the lyrics said it should look like. Are you breaking a vow? For example, here are some songs that Faith Church will be singing 
this week. If you're using our worship at home guide, you've already said or listened to these very words. All our hope is in you. Well, we should ask ourselves, is all our hope really, truly, completely in God? Sure sounds good to sing it, but do we mean it? How about this line? All the glory to you, God. Does your life really give all the glory to God? Or are you maybe giving glory to lesser things from time to time? Here's another one. At the cross, I surrender my life. I think, what does that even look like? It sure is easy to sing it, but how do we do it? How does a person surrender their life to Jesus? I think we really need to talk about this because we sing this. The next phrase is very much related to that one. In the same song, it says, I owe all to you. So we say that, but really, what does it mean to owe all to Jesus? It's, it's a vow that we're taking, but are we thinking about what it means? Is it just having an attitude of gratitude? Just acknowledging that from time to time, or maybe like when we take communion, Lord, we are so thankful that you gave your body and your blood. Is that all that Jesus wants? An attitude of gratefulness once a month? When we sing that phrase, I owe all to you, we need to see it as making a vow. It's not just an attitude. It's actually a vow that says, Lord, I literally owe everything to you. We owe him our lives. And when you owe someone something, you actually pay them back. And so often we say something like, hey, I owe you a lunch. And we can really never get around to taking that person for lunch. Most often, the other person doesn't even really think much of it anyway. It wasn't like they're keeping track necessarily. It's not like they're waiting expectantly and super disappointed because we didn't take them out for lunch. The result is we tend to throw that phrase around a lot and it starts to lose meaning. I owe you starts to actually mean, well, I kind of want to, but if I never actually get around to doing it, it won't matter. Do we make vows like that to Jesus? Do we sing, I owe all to you with very little intention to actually completely surrender our lives to him? Here's the thing. We sing this stuff basically every week. Do you see then how we're taking vows every week, vows to God through the songs that we sing? Sometimes over the years, I've actually thought, Oh man, if, if I can't actually mean that 100%, then maybe I shouldn't even be singing those songs. Because I don't want to be making a vow that I'm not keeping. I mean, that's exactly what the teacher said in verse 5, right? Better not to make a vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Better not to sing a song with words you have no intention of living out. But I've wrestled with that. Do we have to have perfect motivation before we sing the words of any song? I don't think so, or else I wonder if we would ever be able to sing any song. So I've changed the way I view singing lyrics a little bit, and I think it's really helped. I view the songs that I sing as a kind of prayer of aspiration. In, in, in a way, I'm, I'm singing the words of the song like, I surrender my life, or I owe all to you. And simultaneously, as I'm singing out of my mouth, I'm thinking in my mind, Lord, I know I'm not fully there. I, I know that I have not actually surrendered my life 100%, but I want to. I aspire to that. Help me. I need you. I want to grow in this area. In that way, it's, it's a prayer. The song lyrics are an, are an admission that I'm not fully there, but I want to be there, and I need the Lord's help. The problem, I think, is when we stop there, when we, were, we, we sing these words, like thinking, I surrender all, but then we don't do anything to change our lives, to actually enter into the process of surrender. So we have to ask, what does actual surrender look like? What do we do to make it clear, not only to God, but also to the people in our lives, that we are surrendering our lives to Jesus? Answer that question, and then actually do it, and you will have kept your vow. Now, the teacher continues talking about vows in verse 6, and he, 
actually utters what is a very confusing phrase. In the NIV, it says this, and do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Now again, remember, in chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, everything we've been talking about here, the teacher is envisioning this scene of worship at the temple. So somehow, this, this protest, this temple messenger, must have something to do with worship at the temple. So it seems that what he's saying is that during a worship service, a worshiper made a vow. And somehow that vow was noted, it was recorded, and it was actually followed up upon. Meaning there were officials from the temple who were keeping track of this somehow, and they noted, oh, that guy never fulfilled his vow. And so they go and they check up on him and they say things like, uh, you said you were going to sacrifice that goat and you didn't do it yet. And a couple months have gone by. What's going on? There's a lot of parallels to church in this. So maybe the worshiper promises to teach a class, to fix a wall, to serve on a committee. There is a lot of potential vows that someone could make to a church. We've talked about them already. And then that person doesn't follow through. Now, I get it. There's, there's a lot of reasons for not following through. Sometimes we just forget could be a, just a simple scheduling error. I know for me, for example, that like if I get a text message from someone and, and in a sense, I'm in a relationship with them. It's not quite like a vow, but it's so easy to forget if I allow that text message to get buried further and further and further down the list. And before you know it, it's off the screen and I'm totally have forgotten it. It could be simply laziness. It could be a lack of commitment, a procrastination. Maybe we bit off more than we can chew, especially in the midst of our busy lives. Many of us feel that way. Now, this is what I can hear myself say. Maybe you've heard yourself say this, like, why did I say yes to that commitment? Why can't I just say no more often? This people pleasing inside of me is constantly getting me overcommitted. I just have a hard time saying no. Or maybe it's actually your spouse that the, is the one that is saying to you, like, why did you volunteer me for that? And you're thinking to yourself, how can I get out of this commitment? And then that church staff person calls you. That's like that messenger in verse 6 from the temple. And they want to know, where have you been? Why have you missed meetings? Why haven't you been in worship? And how do you respond? Inwardly, you probably have a mixture of feelings. There's probably some guilt, some shame, some embarrassment, uh, probably also a desire to do better. You didn't really want to miss. You intended to be there. But then you also maybe have a fear too. You know yourself. Maybe you fear that you actually won't do better. And maybe you want to people please and you say, I'm so sorry, I promise I'll do it next time. But you know deep down inside what's really in your mind, making that commitment was a mistake. I never should have said yes to that. And so when that person calls you on the phone, in a moment of clarity, in a moment of courage, you just blurt out and you say, my vow was a mistake. You want out. You want to be free from the commitment. You want them to say, oh, it's okay. You're off the hook. But the teacher, back in verse 6, he's not so happy about that response. He says, do not protest that your vow was a mistake. Instead, keep the vow or don't make it in the first place. Why? Because our vows are a part of worship. Our vows are a way that we demonstrate our relationship to God. When we vow to give or vow to serve or vow to do something for the kingdom and then we fail to keep that vow, that's hurtful to God, the teacher says. Now, I'm not totally sure what the teacher's trying to convey with that last phrase. He kind of is depicting God as getting angry and destroying the work of your hands. It sounds like the teacher is saying that if we don't keep our vows, God will punish us. Dorsey's translation is not so harsh. He says, why should God be angered at what you say and take away what you have achieved? Either way, it's very important to God that we keep our vow especially in the context of worship in a church family, especially as disciples of Jesus. 
that leads to the teacher to a conclusion in verse 7. And if you read this verse in, in 10 different translations, you'll probably get 10 different renditions of the verse. But I want to read what he says in the NIV. He says, much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, stand in awe of God. One person says that the teacher is trying to say that people are prone to carry their illusions with them while they worship and also prone to talking without thinking. If a vow is made this way, the worshiper is treading on dangerous ground. The remedy is simply to fear God. Now that phrase, fear God, you might have heard that a lot in your reading in the Bible. It's kind of confusing. Uh, we don't use the word fear in our modern day English the way it was used in older English of the 1600s when the Bible was first translated into English. Uh, that's why the NIV said, stand in awe of God. Or as Dorsey puts it, respect God and submit to his authority. And you know what? That's a definition of worship in a nutshell. Respect God and submit to his authority. When we gather for worship, that's why we sing, to stand in awe of God. Singing transports us to kind of a different plane of existence. There's something about the combination of music and lyrics and, and the human voice singing that helps us experience a taste of the transcendence of God. When we sing, we stand in awe of God. Our hearts and minds are filled with wonder as we consider who he is and what he's done especially because it is not all that often that during our hours and our days throughout the rest of the week that we just stand in awe of God. I mean, how often do you do that? Well, the teacher is saying we should do that, do that a whole lot more. Back in verse 2, the teacher told us that we should be silent before God, and that's when I mentioned about going to the Quaker meeting house, and I said we're going to come back to that idea. Well, we're back to it now. It's not just by singing in worship that we can be in awe of God. It's also in silence. In silence, we contemplate or, or we think about who God is. We contemplate or we think about our relationship with him and the fact that we have the spirit of God living with us. In silence, we contemplate the scripture and we orient our lives around its truth. The silence allows us to contemplate God, to be in awe of God, and the result is that it actually can change our hearts and our minds. The travesty of life in America is that there is so little silence. How can we be in awe of God? Well, it means that we need to intentionally add regular, consistent times in our life when we actually turn off the noise as much as possible. For me, often in the afternoons, I'll, I'll walk down to the church library, or sometimes I'll come right in here in the sanctuary because they're very quiet rooms. And I'll just take time to try and contemplate God, trying to stand in awe of him, thinking about him with respect and wonder. Now, there are many other ways that we can stand in awe of God as well. We can observe nature, for example. Whether you like the starry sky at night or whether you, the moon freaks you out like it does me, especially when you look at it through binoculars like I do, whether you love the woods, whether you love the ocean, whether you love our Lancaster County farmland or you love the mountains, there are so many ways that we can stand in awe of God in the beauty of his creation. It's one of the reasons why I love running, to just go out there through the country roads and smelling that fresh country air, passing the cows, passing the sheep. If I have the right attitude, all of it can make me stand in awe of God, even as I run. I think the teacher would allow that that's one way that we stand in awe of God. So I want to ask you, how do you stand in awe of God? Maybe you're a hunter and you like to go out in nature. Uh, maybe you like to just look at your children or grandchildren, stare into their eyes or watch them play. Maybe it's you love to read a great book about God. Now, of course, it does mean studying the Bible, like I mentioned. But here's the thing. Studying the Bible should not just be an isolated practice that we do alone. I think personal devotions are good and needed. We can stand in awe of God that way. But also remember, the teacher here in Ephesians, or Ecclesiastes 5 is thinking about a person going to temple worship. That means they wouldn't be alone. They would be with a collection, a gathering of worshipers, 
like the gathering of our church family. It's important. There is something, again, formative about being together, singing praises together, sharing together, studying God's word together. The conversations, the encouragement, the challenges, it, it forms us and it shapes us. We stand in awe of God together. And this requires practice. We're called to be a people who stand in awe of God, and that requires the practice of observation, the practice of setting aside regular, consistent time in your life for quiet contemplation, maybe for being in nature, maybe some other method that helps you stand in awe of God. And when you do, you're thinking about him. You're giving him the credit and the glory and the praise for who he is and for what he's done. But it takes practice. And so I want to ask, are you out of practice? What do you need to change in your life to stand in awe of God? Do you need to make it an actual appointment on your calendar? If so, do it and spend time listening to God through his word, through the voice of his spirit, and then do what he says to do because he desires obedience more than sacrifice. The greatest worship that you can give God is a life lived for him, whether that's at home, at work, at school, or in your neighborhood. Let us be worshipers who stand in awe of God. Let that flow out of our lives in obedience to his way. Lord, thank you that you have revealed yourself to us, that we can know you in so many different ways. Yes, you, you are wholly other than us, so different from us. And yet it's amazing to think that you've given us your word. You've placed us in your nature. You live within us by your Holy Spirit, and we can know you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to stand in awe of you, to be worshipers who are, are genuine before you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I thank you for joining us. If you'd like to learn more about Faith Church, visit us online at findfaithhere.org. We'd love to be in contact with you. There's a contact page, and if you want to get in touch, feel free to do that. We'd be glad to talk. Thank you.